Greetings viewers, Eric the Car Guy here, also known as ETCG1. Yes, I'm wearing the hat. Hey, if it's your birthday, happy birthday. Seriously, enjoy your day. Today's discussion topic actually comes from the suggestion box over at the Eric the Car Guy forum from Dudeski1325. Yes, Dudeski1325 asked the question, Eric, I recently watched your, and I'm paraphrasing here, I recently watched your video about uh, modified cars, a technician's point of view, link to that in the description. And uh, you mentioned that you liked steel braided brake lines. Is there any other modifications that you endorse? Once again, paraphrasing. The premise of the other video about modifications, a technician's point of view, was my take on modified vehicles that would come into the dealership or just any other repair establishment that I've worked at. And some of that was taken kind of personally by some viewers, and yeah, I get it, uh, because you know maybe you're heavily into these modifications, it's something you really enjoy, it's, it's something people have a lot of strong opinions about. In fact, the reason why I'm doing this video today is because after that question on the forum was posted, there was a very long discussion, about three pages long at this point, that ensued. Uh, so it's something that obviously there's some interest in, and I'd like to just put some finer points on those uh, modifications and my experiences with those modifications. First of all, as a, as a repair technician, that's what you're doing, um, for the most part, especially if you're working at a dealership or a repair shop. Of course, if you're working in a shop where you modify cars or you do upgrades, things like that, this is a day-to-day -day occurrence. However, if you're working in a general repair shop, especially at the dealer, because that seems to be where these cars end up when, let's just say, we get to a point where we can no longer move forward or we, we don't understand why the modifications that we have made are not working. So you bring it to the dealership in hopes that they can figure it out. They built a car, they should be able to do it. And this is so wrong on so many levels. And, and this is where the issue comes in, at least for me, is that some people, and, and, and I hate to say this, but a majority of the people that modify their cars have absolutely no clue about what they're doing. And they just do it because, well, they bought some parts on eBay and they thought they'd work out. And, and that's the thing. There's, there's two things that you deal with as a technician uh, with these modified vehicles. Number one, it's really cheap mod parts. There's a myriad of parts out there for modifications. Let's just take cold air intakes, quote unquote cold air intakes uh, as, as an example. There's a gajillion of those things out there and it's a very common quote unquote modification. But as far as the quality of parts, the way it fits when it's done, if it actually has an effect, which honestly, very little. And that was proved by Mighty Car Mods and I stand by the results because that's exactly what I've seen. Cold air intakes do very little to improve performance. So cold air intakes, you got a ton of cheap ones out there. And they don't fit right, they don't work right, they don't, they don't do what they're advertised to do. That's got nothing to do with the person bolting it on other than the fact that they thought it would make it better. When in essence, they may be making it worse. Particularly in the case where, say for instance, you actually buy what I consider a proper cold air intake, one that draws air down behind the uh, front bumper, fender, that type of thing, and do not install the uh, check valve in the tube. The thing that basically prevents sucking water up into the engine if you ever uh, go through a deep puddle. And in a lowered vehicle, it's not difficult to find a deep puddle because I'm assuming that that's going to go along with that cold air intake. In fact, I see it quite often. There's a lot of things at play here. And I think the number one thing that's at play here is ignorance. And ignorance means it's a lack of knowledge. Ignorance and stupidity are two different things. Stupid people do things despite the fact that they know better. Ignorant people do things because they don't know better. So please, let's clarify that definition. So there's a, a tremendous amount of ignorance on the part of the people installing these parts. Maybe they don't read the directions. Maybe they don't have the tools. Maybe they don't necessarily have the know-how or expertise or even understand why they would be installing part X on their vehicle to make it go faster, handle better, do something beyond what it was originally intended to do, thus modifying their vehicle. And that's the point I'm trying to make here is, and the reason I'm sitting here in front of my Fairmont, and the reason, one of the main reasons I'm doing this project, well, one of the main reasons is because I want to, but also to, to illustrate the process that one goes through when modifying a vehicle from stock. It's not a straight and narrow path. It's full of twists, it's full of turns, it's full of setbacks, it's full of triumphs, it's full of all kinds of different things. It's only those people that have been doing this a very long time, that have done these modifications, that have the experience with these things. There are experts out there that do this and they're best equipped. 
And sometimes you might be able to find one on a good forum. So if you're on the hunt for modifications for your make and model, I would seek out forums specifically targeting your make and model and see what things other people have done. You can draw upon that knowledge base. Whereas there was a time before the internet when you asked the guy down at the speed shop or whatever, or a bunch of your friends, or you read it in a magazine or something like that, and the information was sketchy. And I'm not saying that the internet is much better, but there's more of it. And if you're able to comb through it, there's, there's more there. So I, I'm just saying by sheer numbers <laughs> and also availability. Um, if, if you didn't have a Nissan guy in your neighborhood and you had the 240Z that you were looking to modify, you were kind of looking for one. Uh, maybe you'd find one of the swap meet or something, just somebody that you could maybe get on the phone to talk to and say, hey, you know, is this a good mod or have you had experience with doing this to your car? Did this work out? Did this not work out? And that, that's the information that becomes invaluable to you because most times modifications are a colossal waste of money. And yes, that's exactly true. You're only doing it for you because you think it will be better. But I'm here to tell you, especially with modern vehicles, there's not a lot of room for improvement. And the room for improvement comes at a cost. So you want to go faster? Well, there goes your fuel economy. So you want it to handle better? Well, there goes your ability to drive over speed bumps. There's always a trade-off. And that's what often gets missed. And that's why I'm going through the process on this, on this Ford. And that's why I made the video about my plan for the Ford and outlined line by line about what I intended to do. I've, had, I've been very fortunate to do what I do and have a lot of experts that have built several of these cars to reach out to me and say, hey, you know, this is good, this is not so good. Invaluable information. I don't know everything. I don't modify cars every day. I do have a show on the internet and I'm exposed to a lot of people, but that doesn't mean that I know absolutely everything about everything. In fact, oftentimes I'm figuring it out as I go. It's, it's mostly common sense. And that's what's lacking in a lot of the modifications that I've seen come into dealerships. There's an intention, but that intention is not met by reality. The reality is the parts are cheap. The reality is the installation is crap. And the reality is you send it to the technician to fix it. But the thing of it is, it's not a stock car. Dealerships work in the flat rate system. So they have a prescribed amount of time that they give you to do things. Other than that, it's straight time. And straight time means you basically punch, punch the work order in on the time clock and there's the time and you let it run until you're done. And then the customer pays whatever's on that ticket. Well, that rarely happens because the service writer feels bad, something like that. And that's why technicians at a dealership don't like to work on these vehicles because they often involve the extra time. The extra time to try to figure out what it is your ignorance caused that got you to the dealership in the first place. Now let's talk about the other group that was also brought up in this discussion. And that is the group that actually knows what they're doing or has a pretty good, decent idea about what they're doing. These people will next to never bring their vehicles to the dealership because they did the modifications. They know what they did. They know what the car is doing. They know, you know about the hidden switch somewhere or they know about that bolt that didn't necessarily work out and it's just hanging on by a thread, literally, <laughs> and not to touch it so that the whole thing doesn't come apart or you know they know the vehicle they become intimate with it it becomes part of them those modifications are an extension of them and they've they've made the mistakes they put in their time they're not necessarily going to be the ones that are going to bring it to somebody else to have something done unless for instance there's a warranty or recall issue that's when we'll see them and then we'll have to deal with them and then we just target that warranty or whatever but however once again if those modifications, larger turbo, something like that, or a turbo where there wasn't one before, makes accessing that warranty part that much more difficult. And, and that's, that's why I, in my last video, was talking about the frustrations with those modified vehicles. Do I have a problem with modified vehicles? No. Look behind me. That's what I'm doing. And it's not going to be the last one I do, trust me. But that's not the point. The point is, is if you go into modifying your vehicle with ignorance, forget about it. Take your money, throw it into the ocean. It'll have the same effect. As I said, a colossal waste of your time if you don't have an idea of what you wanna do when you go to modify your vehicle. What you want that vehicle to do in the end. Why are you modifying it? You're trying to impress your friends, trying to get girls or boys. You're, you're missing the point. I mean, it's the love of the machine that brings you to that place where you're doing those modifications. And it's an understanding of that machine that makes those modifications successful. So the most important thing I can recommend to somebody looking to modify their vehicle is knowledge. Figure, get some books or find, find the forums online, find, find the information online. And 
As far as getting back to the parts, the, the aftermarket parts, the modified parts that you put on your vehicle, look for companies that have done the research. Don't look for somebody that's out in, let's just say it, China, just with a cookie cutter, just going ka-chunk, 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 spitting out things, sold by some company here in the US uh, that states that you get X horsepower gains out of bolting on this part. There is no such thing as bolt-on horsepower. I'll just tell you that right now. That's not how it works. As I said, cold air intakes, Anybody that says they're getting 30 horsepower out of a cold air intake is smoking something that, uh, you know, is altering their perception of reality. <laughs> the reality is, is there's very little, if any, gains. In fact, it's most times you may actually do worse by putting a quote-unquote cold air intake. And I, I say quote-unquote cold air intake because I can't stand the fact that they take a stock air intake system that draws air from, like I said, behind the front tire, down around the bumper someplace, someplace where there actually is cool air, and replace it with something that's drawing air in the, from the hot engine compartment. So it's 100 degrees outside, and you took your air that you were taking from close to the ground, away from the engine compartment, and now you're taking the air from the engine compartment that's already warmed up and putting it in the engine. And you call that a cold air intake. I say it's a misnomer. and It's just, it's a complete waste. Oh, hang on, it's not a complete waste of time. It's a fun, easy upgrade to do your vehicle that makes the engine sound better and makes you feel like you have more power from your vehicle. It's not like back in the day when you took off the, the two barrel intake and carburetor off of your engine and bolted on a four barrel intake and carburetor and you instantly got real power. Why? Because you were increasing the air and fuel intake of that engine and giving it the, the ability to make more power. Mechanically speaking, you could do that at one time. It's not so much anymore. They've been, they've engineered that away. So you need to find the people making the parts that actually engineer the parts that sit there and do dyno testing, that do tuning, you know, that there's, a, there's a whole lot more that goes with it now. That it's not just the parts. You also have to change the program so that the computer understands that there are different parts there and it can run differently. That there is a higher fuel pressure, that there are differences, that there are upgrades to the system that you alter. You have to let the computer know that because otherwise it's not going to understand it. It's not going to be able to fully utilize those modifications. And that's what that gets back to education, knowledge, figuring out what works. All right, lastly, on this wonderful rant that I've gone on. I like steel braided brake lines. That's why I mentioned that before. It's not a modification that affects any other system of the vehicle, but it does give you a brake, better brake pedal feel. It gives you a tremendous brake pedal feel and response. So it does feel like a good performance upgrade. The first thing that I did to my, my Fairmont behind me is I strengthened the frame, strengthened the body. It doesn't have a frame. I strengthened the body to try and make it so that the suspension can work better, so that it can handle the extra torque that I'm gonna be putting through this chassis. It was the first thing I did, and with good reason, because like I said, it's a process. And there are other things I'm gonna be doing all the way, but I started with structural and the structural integrity of this Fairmont is weak. <laughs> to say the least, it's weak, but it's getting better, and I hope to make it great by the time I'm done. To wrap this up, and I'm sure there will be plenty of discussion about it, but to wrap this up, do your homework. Talk to people that know, and it's, it's specific to your vehicle what's gonna work and not gonna work. And lastly, don't take a slow car and try to make it fast. You know, taking a, a Civic DX and trying to make it into a race car Okay, fine, <laughs> have fun. But you're much better off starting with a Civic Si that already has an upgraded suspension, already has upgraded brakes, and all these parts to start with. It was built to go fast to begin with. If you're trying to make slow cars fast, you're gonna have to work extra hard. And not saying, you know, you don't love the car, it's the only car you have, it's, it's what you want, fine, I get it. But if you wanna do this for real, don't try to make a slow car fast. Try to make, well, <laughs> Here I am talking about my Fairmont in the back behind me. That's, that's yeah, I, I realize the irony in that, but still, you're, you're much better off trying to take a fast car and make it faster, handle better, than you are to try to take a slow car and make it handle better. But I got a plan for the Fairmont. In fact, I've altered those plans a little bit to uh, ease the pain of the amount of work and effort that I'm gonna need to do to get it to where I want it to be. You'll see that in coming videos. Anyway, I've thrown a lot at you in this video. I know that but there will be a link in the description to a discussion about this, also links to additional information, so please check there if you have questions. And hey, if you have automotive questions, I would ask that you head over to ericthecarguy.com. Welcome video there to tell you about what can help you. 
If you wish to connect with me socially, I can be found on Google+, Facebook, Twitter, now Instagram, and I close each of my videos, including ETCG1, with be safe, have fun, stay dirty, and do your homework. I'll see you next time.